So I think most of you probably already know Jenna. She's an artist, designer, built her own creative business. You're the, um, you have two best-selling watercolor books now, which yeah, is incredible. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And you also um, have a YouTube channel with so many uh, tutorials. So if you haven't seen her YouTube channel, definitely check them out. I actually have done some of them and I should right. maybe show my, show my watercolors. They're not very good though. Um, and you have your own business now, which is amazing. And all, while doing all of this, you are a semi new mother, I, don't, I guess still a new mother. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Um, we were supposed to have Michael Ginsburg here, but I think he is the one that really messed up this webinar jam. So we're going to keep him out for the time being and we'll have him Hello. on the 12th. Um, and when he comes on the 12th, we'll talk about, he actually created the paper that Jenna loves. So he'll talk a little bit about um, how he created it, why he created it, et cetera. But I think we should start off with from the beginning and talk about like how you started your career in art. I know you didn't start in art. I think you started in a whole nother industry. So can you talk about how what you started in and how you decided to become an artist and teacher? Yeah, so it's a pretty random story, but um, I was living in Chicago from 2007 to about the end of 2012, sick of the winters. I'm from sunny Southern California, which is where I live currently again, but um, I just, I couldn't put up with the winters anymore. I love Chicago, the city is beautiful, but I just couldn't do it. And you're on the East Coast, so you so you get the you get the chilly winters. Um, but being a California girl, I was just not into it. So we were looking to move. My husband and I were looking to move back to Southern Southern California. And my uncle, who is a uh, financial planner, he um, offered me a job as his executive assistant. And so I was. Uh, that's what got us to move from Chicago back home to Southern California. And in transit from Chicago to California, we packed up all of our boxes, obviously, and we used a um, allied, trunk, allied truck moving company to move all of our furniture, all of our boxes out to Southern California. And they dropped off all the stuff when we found an apartment and we started unpacking these boxes and somebody else's art box or somehow someone's art box got mixed in our stuff that was on the truck. And so we were unpacking in our new apartment and, you know, everything looked like ours until I came across this box that didn't have a name on it. And it had calligraphy pens in it. It had paint brushes. It had uh, really cheap acrylic paint and paper. Uh, nothing like the, like the supplies I use today, like Legion paper, obviously. <laughs> um, didn't, didn't know about this in 2013 uh, quite yet. And so I just started doodling and um, I was always like a, habitual doodler in school. I never paid attention in class. I was a terrible student. I was always doodling like names, people's names or sketching eyeballs. I, I was really good at sketching right eyeballs, terrible at left ones. So I'm really good at the right side of people's faces for portraits, but the, terrible with the left. Um, and so I've always been a habitual doodler, but because I was working in an office environment, a corporate environment, and that was nothing like what I'd ever experienced before because I'd always worked in restaurants and was always a waitress. Um, it was soul sucking to me. It was just, I'm a type B person. I'm a creative. I've just, I've always done music. I've always been in that sort of like creative sphere. And so driving an hour commute both ways to the office and then sitting in an office nine to five and basically filing IRA applications for people looking to retire soon was just not inspiring for me. It wasn't like my soul was like, yes, this is exactly what I meant to do. <laughs> And so I would, after, you know, coming home from work, I would bust open that art box. Nobody claimed the art box, by the way. We called Allied Moving Truck Company and they said nobody said they were missing a box of art supplies. So I eventually used it as my own. And um, I started posting my work on Instagram. I, if you scroll really far back on my Instagram, at Jenna Rainey is my Instagram and go all the way back down to 2013, you'll see my early, early days of exploring watercolor and calligraphy and very newbie, like not good at all. But that was like, I finally found something that I was obsessed with and I couldn't stop thinking about it. So 
while I was at the office at my day job, I would, you know, be doodling and coming up with these ideas of what I was really excited to paint when I got home at night. And I would paint at my kitchen table and just become obsessed with it. And so after um, a couple of months of doing this, my husband was like, you should start posting your work on Instagram. And this was, you know, really early days of Instagram. People weren't using it for like an advertising tool for business. It was just kind of like family and friends follow you and that's about it. And so I started posting it on Instagram reluctantly because it felt like I was bragging a little bit like, hey, look what I can do. Uh, and I wasn't good at the time, but it still were felt you, like bragging. Were you watching YouTube channels to figure it all out or you just, it was all from your mind? Well, I mean, I was definitely like looking at photos of things or whatever, but I don't, I don't know why, but I didn't really like discover the power of YouTube yet. Probably right. a couple of years into it, I was you know, into YouTube. And some people were starting to post like artwork on Instagram here and there, but it wasn't like, this is my business, sign up for my thing here or take my class or whatever. It wasn't like that at all. So I don't know if anybody here knows Hazel Wonderland. This is like from the archives, calligrapher, wedding stationer, watercolorist. She doesn't do it anymore. She, I don't know what she does with her life anymore, actually. <laughs> but she was like the one artist or creative entrepreneur, I guess, that I followed on Instagram. And the only one that I knew of, obviously there was rifle paper, but I don't think she, I mean, she may have had an Instagram. I'm not sure, but I didn't follow her. So anyway, I was following Hazel Wonderland and I was like, wow, this person is able to make a business out of doing watercolor and calligraphy. And so I was inspired by that. And I kept obsessing over this watercolor thing and this um, calligraphy thing. And so would paint. And eventually after uh, just a couple of months of posting on Instagram, I was able to quit my day job after working there for about five months. I started there in January 2013. And that's when I also um, created an, Et an Etsy shop for like family and friends to buy prints for me. I basically had like E.E. E. Cummings prints or like lettered pieces and Mother Teresa quotes and stuff. And five months after that, I was able to go full time with my business around June of 2013. So I have been doing this thing for, I mean, I kind of started a little bit in 2012. I would do like some lettering pieces for some friends, but roughly, I mean, like the hard number anniversary date is June, 2013. And was that your stationary business that you started then? Yes. So I started as what really catapulted my business was a friend of mine was getting married in February, 2013. And she saw that I had uh, I had been getting into calligraphy and calligraphy place cards, you know, menus, varying things are really popular in the wedding industry. And um, back then it was just really starting to boom. There wasn't much competition yet. It was like pretty early days of like the calligrapher scene. And so she hired me to do a few things for her day of wedding. So I like lettered her vows that her husband and her wrote and their menus and she happened to have a really good photographer who got their wedding posted on a big wedding blog. I think it was Style Me Pretty or Ruffled or Wedding Chicks or something like that. Wow. And I got maybe one client or two clients after that blog post went up. And that one client that hired me for their Save the Dates ended up firing me because um, the calligraphy ink I chose for the envelopes didn't show up. And all of the all of the Save the Dates came back to them in the post office. No. Um, so that was like my big mega fail uh, as becoming a business owner. And I was like, this sucks. Why did I decide to leave my day job? Why, did, why am I doing this? is not fun. Yeah, a little more stressful. Yeah. So I started as a wedding stationery designer to answer your question. And then uh, just really found a love for teaching about two years into having this full time business. I was just you know, working client client based work, doing wedding and it's custom wedding invitation jobs. And then a local shop in Fullerton, California, I live in Newport Beach area, and a local shop in Fullerton reached out. And this was, my Instagram was probably a couple thousand people or maybe 10,000 at the time. Um, and which was like kind of big for people at the time because there wasn't much competition. Like I'm still like back then there just wasn't a lot of art people growing their following online yet. Um, there, there was obviously other accounts. I wasn't the only one by any means. Um, but 10,000, I was like, yeah, I'm pretty popular on Instagram. <laughs> uh, and so she reached out, the shop owner reached out and asked if I would ever think about teaching a calligraphy class, like a calligraphy workshop. And I'd never taught before. I was still learning calligraphy myself, but I've never been a, 
at like imposter syndrome, I'll wait till I'm ready type of person. I've always said yes and figured it out. Right. Um, and that's just been the case every step of the way with my business. It launched my workshop career. I was then after teaching my first calligraphy class, I was hooked and taught every weekend for the next four or five years. I traveled the world teaching in-person workshops. I've been to Singapore, Australia, Paris, Germany, all over the world teaching these workshops. And then it eventually went from calligraphy to watercolor being my main teaching thing. And that's when I discovered Legion paper, Stonehenge Aqua cold press paper, because yes. when you're teaching, you have all of these costs, um, you know, providing all of these uh, materials for students. And I was like, like, well, Arches is too expensive. Fabriano is too hard to get your hands on at, a, at scale and it's too expensive. And Legion paper is the same quality, but it's way cheaper. And so that's when my love for Legion paper, Stonehenge Aqua became uh, in my life. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. So going so, back, I'm, I feel like I'm going to kind of mix a lot of your creative business and how you started your business with your artwork. Um, so just going back about Stonehenge Aqua, like what was it about the paper aside from like it being affordable that drew you to the paper? Because I know I think you switched from Arsh from the beginning, right? So I was I was Arsh first because that was just like the, the the mecca. Everybody, every watercolors talked about Arsh, and I don't remember the ins and outs of how I found your paper. It might have been at, a, at an art supply store or something, but I was literally like, "This is just like Fabriano, like the quality from Fabriano, the texture." Because Arsh has always been too rough for my taste. I don't like how bumpy it is, and other reasons for not liking it, but. It's obviously really great paper and every artist is different, but Fabriano was like, oh, I love this paper. It's great, it's just a little expensive. But then Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press was like the same texture I was looking for in, out of Fabriano, the same like off-white. Wow, and you work on cold press really only. Do you ever work on a hot press paper or? I have here and there, like I have some around that I've tried and I just, I love the texture and the way it holds the pigment. Cause I do work with quite a lot of water. Um, you know, there's different techniques with watercolor. Some people like it drier, some people like it wetter. Um, and I just, I use a lot of water because I love the bleeding moments that happen with two pigments or areas of water touching. Um, and so I use a lot of water and with hot press paper, I just notice that there's a big difference in how it dries and there's a lot of like you know hard lines and rings if you're not careful obviously people who are paying really close attention to how things are starting to dry can recover it before it dries when you're working on hot press paper um, but i'm not patient enough for that kind of style so i definitely need something that has the toothy texture to hold things in place and to really make sure things dry kind of smoothly with the amount of water i use right and um so kind of moving on from there, what I know you use a bunch of other um, products with your watercolor. So what are three tools you would say artists must use or need to use to get started in creating? So paper is crucial. Obviously, I, I honestly believe paper is probably the most important out of your supplies, because if you have a mediocre brush or you have you know, mediocre pigments or whatever, like you can get by. There's definitely advantages to having good brushes and good supplies all around. But if the paper isn't high quality enough, like for example, in my early days, I, I was working on Canson watercolor paper and it's really smooth. It's just not high quality. It's very cheap. It's very inexpensive, which is a huge advantage for some people. Um, but it's just frustrating when your results don't look like the watercolor, you know, tutorial that you're following from YouTube, um, you know, when something dries completely different or the colors aren't as saturated as they are in your palette or you don't get that wet and wet bleeding action happening like the tutorial you're following online is getting. So it's really important to have good paper. Um, that's where I would start is finding a really good paper that you love. And then um, brushes. I love Princeton brushes. If you follow me online, you guys know that I love Princeton brushes. Heritage 4050 brushes are my favorite. They're just really snappy. They hold a good amount of pigment and water, you know, flexible. Um, so I would start there. And then I also, if you guys have read my books or follow me on YouTube and whatnot, then you know that the pigment that I love using is Windsor & Newton and I use professional level. But there's some other great pigments out there too, like um, where is the one? Daniel Smith watercolor, Holbein and whatnot. There's, there's other great, Da Vinci is good. Um, I've just always used Windsor Newton, so I just have never yeah. really 
switch. I feel like there's just so many options. It's like, where do we even start looking at all these different options? Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of want to get into also how you grew your business even more. Do you think that it is essential for for artists to have an Instagram to kind of connect with other people? Or what would you suggest about Instagram? Like, you have to have it or it's okay not to have it? I love this question because there are so many amazing, obviously amazing benefits to uh, using Instagram as a area of growing your business. Um, one thing that I do see that's problematic with people, especially in the creative sphere is imposter syndrome, getting discouraged by growth rate and not seeing their follower count ticking up as fast as they would like and getting distracted. So Instagram is like the shiny, sexy marketing tool that like everyone thinks they need to have influencer numbers. They need to have like 200,000, whatever plus followers on Instagram in order to be a successful creative business. And that's just not the truth. So I would, I would think my recommendation or advice to somebody who is either starting or trying to grow their creative business online is to really think about who their ideal customer is and where they are spending most of their time. So actually, if you're a watercolorist or you are some sort of artist or creative business owner, most people are on YouTube or on Pinterest versus Instagram. Sure, there's a lot of people on Instagram. People use Instagram every single day if they're Instagram users. Um, however, if somebody is actually trying to learn how to paint something or purchase watercolor prints, they're not on Instagram searching for where's a you know, perfect watercolor print for a nursery. They're not on Instagram searching for that. They're on Pinterest searching for that or they're on Google searching for that. So my biggest advice is to not get distracted by Instagram, it definitely helps to be on Instagram and it's like a visual portfolio and versus the, you know, a decade ago when people were using like their online portfolios, their websites and whatnot, and they were, you know, creating actual one sheets or PDFs of their, of their, um, of their portfolio and sending it out to agencies or sending it out to people to work with. So I think there is an advantage to having and spending time consistently on Instagram and building that as a tool. Um, but there's just really important boundaries to have. Social media is such an addiction and it can be really, really discouraging if you're yes. like seeing your growth. So my <laughs> thing would be to think about how many, how many prints or how many classes or whatever it is your business is, how many of that thing that you need to sell um how many of that thing that you need to sell in order to make a living and then also to make a profit off of that living so if your costs are whatever rent mortgage bills blah 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 plus a profit and so if that's 200 sales of prints a month okay then let's double down on the on the platform that's making the most sense for you to get that amount of sales or if it's 50 sales or whatever and so sure having a hundred thousand followers or more or whatever on Instagram is going to be an advantage to help you sell more of that thing on your Etsy shop or more of that thing on your website or whatever. But it is not the end all be all. There's email list marketing, there's Facebook ads, there's Facebook marketing, there's Pinterest marketing. I've seen the most success or actually the most um, uh, visitors to our website from Pinterest across the board for the entire last eight years that I've had my business, not wow. Instagram. You would think it would be my Instagram. I only have like 7,300 followers on Pinterest versus my 200,000 followers on Instagram, but Pinterest is always the top for our um, analytics. So I would obviously recommend people have an Instagram and you know consistently post to it and try it out, but it's just, it's just not the uh, end all be all for everyone and Pinterest is huge. Right. I agree. And it's also kind of so many artists have Instagrams now and Pinterest now. So I think it's a little bit of how can I make myself a little bit different on these platforms or show people what they are coming for and what they really want to see. So it it kind of goes hand in hand. But even going beyond that. So now um, you started your business and what was your first big project that kind of put you in or put you, I don't want to say on the map, but like mm -hmm. that really helped you launch your career? That's a good question. I am a, a very, very terrible memory. Um, <laughs> but I would say, uh, so in the probably the second year of business, it wasn't one client job or one 
like thing that I remember really putting me on the map. It was just that I hustled my booty off to get as many client jobs as I possibly could that next year. So I've shared this story on my podcast before in various places before. So maybe somebody's heard this before, but I the probably eight or nine months after starting my business, when I launched my Etsy shop in January, 2013, probably nine months after that, I collected a list of wedding planners and wedding photographers. That was about a hundred emails and names. And I got them from various wedding blogs. I got them from a photographer friend of mine who was just doing a really nice favor. Like we barely knew each other. And I was like, Hey, can you help me out? And he sent me like a huge list of wedding planners that he's worked with, like really top notch wedding planners that, like probably just laughed when they received the email because I'd literally never worked in the industry before. And they were doing these like huge celebrity weddings. So anyway, I had this huge list of emails and no shame, no looking back. I just sent them pitch emails, a hundred of these pitch emails. <laughs> and I was like, somebody has got to respond. And two people responded. One of those uh, was a no. And like, thanks for sending us an email, but we don't see a good fit with any of our clients right now. We'll reach out if that ever changes. And they never did, obviously. Um, <laughs> and then the second response was somebody who was like, oh my gosh, I just met with a client who's looking for, you know, somebody who can do calligraphy and also watercolor and more floral work and blah, blah, blah. So I was like a one-stop shop for them. And they're like, can you design the wedding invitations? This was my very first wedding invitation job ever. Um, this is the save the date people that fired me. And uh, so I, I feel like that is what, like the itch that I had that I couldn't stop scratching, even though it ended up becoming a huge failure. Um, I lost money on the job because we printed the invitations and I just felt so bad and mortified that everything went sent back to the couple that I covered the cost myself. And I was already, you know, not making any money as a business owner because it was my first few months and I quit way too early. I didn't have any savings built up, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I think it was just the, I, I need to make this work. I'm a type eight on the Enneagram. If anybody knows the Enneagram, we type eights are, we do, we do not do well with failure. We do not do well with giving up. And so if something is a failure or a mistake, it's just a learning lesson. It's not a stopping point. It's a learning lesson. It's a growing a growth curve or an area to grow in. And so from there, I, you know, cried for a couple hours after I got the email, <laughs> but I just went back to it. Um, and I don't know what happened after that, how I got my next client. I think it was just kind of like a combination of continuing to send out client emails or pitch emails and not feeling any shame. I mean, looking back now and the work that I sent them, it was just like, I was not good. <laughs> Did you ever get to the point where you felt like, okay, I cannot say no to anyone. I have to take on as many jobs as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then did you get overwhelmed? Were you like, oh no, I, now I took on too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the second year of business, I think I had about 42 wedding uh, jobs um, in a 52 year, obviously a 52 week year, obviously. And so I was very overwhelmed. I worked 80 to hundred hours a week multiple weeks in a row a lot that was a very common thing i missed a lot of um baby showers weddings birthdays and i'm not bragging obviously that was a huge bummer in my personal life i lost a lot of friends because of how much i was having to work and build this business but um i had these deadlines and i had these clients that were waiting for things and if anybody works in the wedding industry designing wedding stationery custom stationery is a lot of back and forth there's a lot of changes and revisions because the wedding industry, they're just really particular about their colors, their paper texture, a lot of different things. And so that second year was a blow. It was like so amazing, but also so difficult at the same time because I was working so much and just didn't have a life. <laughs> um, but that third year I hired um, a calligrapher. Her name is Brooke Dita. We're still very good friends. She worked with me for five years. Um, and she basically started taking all of the calligraphy addressing parts of the job off of my plate. So I was basically just designing the invitations and then she was addressing all of the envelopes. So that was huge for me because I did not like sitting there for hours and hours and hours each week addressing yeah. hundreds of envelopes. Um, and so that really helped me out the third year of uh, my business. That was like 2015 or 16 when she started and then it just kind of continued to grow after that she i you know 
slowly started relinquishing all of the wedding jobs over like duties over to her. She started doing all of the design. So I would just be doing the artwork and then she would scan and digitize and put together the proofs for the wedding invitations. And then eventually I just gave her all of the wedding jobs and I was doing online classes and teaching more workshops in person. And then eventually I started getting into licensing about three years ago. I met my agent, Julie Turkel, and I just, for example, just launched a case five collection with my artwork on it and a planner That's collection. Awesome. Yeah, a planner collection. So this is all like licensed work that I do now. And I painted this floral piece actually so like 16 on Legion paper, of course. And that. yeah, so now I just do licensing and teach online classes and I love it. And I no longer do wedding and stations. Wow. <laughs> and well, this kind of goes hand in hand with the wedding invitations and even like your artwork that you're doing now. Where do you come up with the ideas or inspiration? Is it some, like you see something and it pops into your head and you want to paint it. Or if someone comes to you and they're saying, okay, I want you to design my wedding invitation, but I don't, I don't even know where to start. Like how do you, where do you start? Yeah. So the inspiration phase is very different for working with wedding clients versus licensing programs. So for example, when I was a wedding stationary designer, the client would come to me with, here's our wedding colors. Our bridesmaids are going to be wearing maroon or whatever, and then we're gonna have gold accents on the table. So we had a very like specific vision from the client or design brief from the client that I had to follow. And so the inspiration was kind of controlled. It felt like I was boxed in a lot of the times. This is kind of why I relinquished a lot of the wedding stuff slowly but surely, and then eventually completely abandoned it because I kind of felt stuck creatively. I felt like I kept hitting roadblocks and I wasn't able to break these ceilings and like actually feel fulfilled out of my work because it was always whatever the client wanted to do. And if they didn't like something, I had to redo it and it had to be on their terms. Um, and so obviously it's what got my start and I'm very grateful for the wedding industry and the wedding clients that I've had, but I just felt like I grew out of it. And then so with licensing, the inspiration phase is different. I basically get to paint collections that I come up with that I'm inspired by um, a lot of my inspiration for collections because again another thing with licensing is you're not just painting one thing and then sending it off to a manufacturer you're painting a full collection which is usually anywhere from 10 to 12 prints or patterns in one collection so for example I'm currently working on a Tulum collection uh, I went to Tulum Mexico a couple years ago and fell in love. I love that place so much. It's just beautiful. The beach, the scenery, the textures, the food, the colors. And color is has always been something I've obsessed with, color theory specifically. And it's something that I'm very heavily um, like educated in. My mom was a color theory teacher when I was in junior high. I spent a lot of time in my early career days just researching and educating myself on color theory because I find it fascinating. Um, and so I basically a lot of my work for licensing revolves around a specific color scheme or theme. And I'm taking a lot of pictures when I travel. Obviously, we're not traveling these days because of coronavirus. But, um, you know, when I went to Paris or Germany or Australia or whatever, I'm taking photos of the botanical gardens in Singapore and different angles of these orchids and these beautiful color combinations on these leaves and just like how the the ocean looks on the seashore or whatever the the really soft beige color of the sand and the teal color of the ocean and taking a photo of that and using that as inspiration or as a guide for collections um you know and then just immersing myself so if it's like an ocean themed collection for example what are we seeing in that theme are we seeing coral what type of sea creatures are we are we looking at is there uh, seaweed and then having those as like, okay, this is my theme. And then I'm going to paint those things and make patterns out of them. So instead of having a client come to me and say, I want you to paint this color coral, this color, I was going to say piranha, but who wants a piranha on their wedding? <laughs> you never know. Or fish, actually. I don't know. Um, this color sea bass, <laughs> this is really, <laughs> weird. um, instead of having that specific you know, direction, what I had to follow. I'm now creating these worlds on my own, which is amazing and so fun. It's kind of like a musician or, you know, somebody who's, cre or an author who's creating a series or like, uh, I almost said George Clooney. Who's the, who's the dude, <laughs> George that made Star Wars. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm the wrong person. Yeah, you all know <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
people, musicians, let's take that example, creating an album. They're not just creating a song and then moving on, unless they're brand new and they're doing EPs. But they're creating a whole world of songs that creates this full experience. And then they're naming it a thing that they extract from that theme or that experience. And that's basically what I do as a licensing artist and designer is create these collections that go off of a theme that I'm inspired by, colors that I'm inspired by, and just kind of pulling the whole world together. It's really Yeah, fun. it's a lot to think about. So someone was asking, oh, so it's George Lucas, is that it? Yes, that's it. There we go. <laughs> um, so someone was asking, do you use live flower samples for your paintings? Sometimes. I think you said you take pictures. Yeah, I have a lot of pictures. So I have, uh, my phone screen is terribly cracked. Uh, and there's my son. But I have a lot of albums on on um, my iPhone on in like my photo albums saved. Like here's Tulum, here's ocean themed photos, here's florals, here's specific color palette ones. And so that I can always just pull that together. And then I usually create a secret board on Pinterest and pull like 12 to 15 photos that kind of go along the same either color scheme or like theme, like if it's ocean, I'm not going to have photos of a desert in the ocean board, obviously. So I create like a specific secret, secret board with about 10 to 15 photos in it. And then from there, I take those 10 to 15 photos, like I take a screenshot of them all together in a grid and I bring it into Adobe Illustrator and I use the eyedropper tool and grab the main uh, colors. So my main colors are like going what what I'm going to use in my hero prints. So we have like three main colors in our hero prints and then some supportive colors that are going to be in our supportive prints in the collection because there's more than just hero prints in the collection there's filler pages and planners there's stickers that you can make in planners so it's it's not just one print and you're done it's multiple pieces of art right and then mm -hmm. we did have another question um how did you find your agent for licensing so i circling back to when I started teaching workshops, I actually was teaching a workshop in New York where you used to live um, in Dumbo, yes. Brooklyn. And the shop that I was teaching at was owned by Dabney Lee, who, um, if you don't know who she is, she's, which I wouldn't be surprised because she's like really not good at Instagram. Um, but she is a very, very successful licensing artist. And she is all over the place. Her patterns are all over the place in Target, Barnes & Noble, um, home goods all over. And uh, I taught a workshop probably in 2015 at her studio. And then I had Nomadics, which is a yoga towel company. I can't find it. It's probably in my closet. A uh, yoga towel company reached out to me and asked how much I would charge to for them to use three of my prints on their yoga towels. And this was my first, you know, experience or little foyer into uh, licensing. And I had no clue what, like every artist when they're starting in something, no clue what to charge. And so the only thing that I could think of at the time was, oh yeah, Dabney does licensing. I should ask her because she works with manufacturers and product owners all the time. So she probably knows. So I texted her. I was like, hey, Dabney, I got this. This person approached me. They're asking for pricing. What would you charge? Just like every new endeavor artist person does when they're asking somebody who they look up to. And so I asked her what she would charge and she was like, oh, it's different per thing. And I work with an agent. So here's my agent's contact information. So pretty serendipitous. Um, knew her or met her through uh, a woman who I met in New York randomly. And then so that was 2015 when I met Dabney, I believe. Julie and I started working together in 2017, my agent. Um, and so she basically signed on with me because she saw that I had this licensing deal already in place. So it's easy to take and run with and a very, very expensive uh, library of work because of all the years that I had been spent doing wedding stationery. The wedding stationery clients do not own the artwork. That's in my contract. Uh, I own the artwork, right? So the artwork. So I'm able to reuse that artwork that I have in my library for, from wedding jobs now on products and then obviously creating new collections all the time. Wow. It's a lot mm -hmm. to think about, I feel like. Yes. So now that you have your business, what does like your day look like? Um, well, <laughs> very, <laughs> very, aside from being a mother. <laughs> uh, it is very different um, than it was two years ago before I had my son. So uh, my husband works for me as well. So we both work from home, which is an amazing, amazing blessing, obviously. 
However, if any of you guys are stay at home moms or dads, then you know how chaotic it, it can be. You get little spurts of time to work and then, then you're, you don't get those spurts. Which probably so, a lot of people are experiencing now. So. Especially now, yeah. So we have a almost two-year-old. He'll be two in February and he is such a good kid. So fun. A lot of energy. Um, he naps like probably two hours each day, unless he's deciding he doesn't want to nap. And that's always fun. But so I definitely work between the times of 11 and 1.30. <laughs> um, but I usually take the morning shift of uh, like first thing when I wake up, I get the baby, we do breakfast, we go for like an hour walk and I'm usually listening to an audio book. I love audio books. I've been devouring books lately. We go for a walk around the neighborhood, especially right now it's fun because people have Halloween, Halloween decorations out and Miles loves saying ghosts. He loves seeing ghosts and the spiders oh. all on these houses. So it's super cute and fun. And then when we come back, John and I switch um, and I get to work. So that's why I, it's 10 o'clock, well, almost 11 o'clock for me on the West coast. Um, so around 10 o'clock is when I usually start working and it usually starts with a meeting with my operations manager on Monday mornings, every Monday at 10, we have our meetings. And then, uh, during, uh, miles nap time, I am usually getting stuff ready for my podcast, recording things for my podcast, or we're recording, uh, filming YouTube videos. We crank out like four tutorials during his two hour nap <laughs> and yes. it's crazy. But so your podcast cool. is, is semi new, right? I launched it in January this year. Yeah. Okay. So it's semi new and we hit the top 50 charts in business within a month, which was awesome. That's incredible. Um, yeah. And then the YouTube channel, we only started April, 2019. And I think we're at almost 70,000 subscribers now or something. And we have over 50 tutorials um and my husband is my videographer so that's what he does for me is he films all the tutorials he edits the podcast he edits the tutorials he uploads the videos to youtube and so it's kind of like this fun combination behind the scenes of who's doing what for the youtube and who's doing what for the podcast but every week is very different for me because i am so 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 type b that I know it sounds backwards, but I really do need structure in my weeks. Otherwise it will get pushed back and I will procrastinate so hard and just not get it done until the day it's due. And yeah. so because I have a team now that works with me in my business, like an operations manager, marketing director, and various other people, I need to be on time with my tasks. So my first week of the month, I'm doing YouTube stuff. We're filming all of our tutorials. Um, I'm creating new ideas for new tutorials. That's the first week of every single month. So whether that's during nap time or in the morning when I'm able to get work done, because the afternoons we're both hanging out with the baby and not working usually. Um, but so YouTube is the first week. Second week is licensing projects and anything that needs to happen for online courses. So kind of splitting up the week that way. The third week is my podcast week. So I am recording all of the next month's podcast and then some. So usually six weeks out, I'm recording like probably eight in one week uh, podcasts. And then the fourth week is just kind of any odds and ends that still are left over, usually gearing up for um, more recordings for podcasts or YouTube stuff or any sort of like back ends. When we're launching an online course, um, there's just a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into it. And so we have four new lessons for updates, stuff like that. So every week is different. Every day is different because as any parent knows, you can never predict how your day is going to go when you have a child. Um, but yeah, that's kind is of... each is each platform for you. So your podcast, your YouTube channel, your social media, is it all geared towards a specific market? Like are your podcasts talking more about your licensing and your YouTube geared more towards artists that want to learn how to do watercolors? Is Do you specify for each? Yeah, so I don't specify... Um per topic, I specify per person. So my podcast is for the creative business owner. Usually that means graphic designer, artist. There are some hairstylists and photographers and other odds and ends, not odds and ends, but for me, because I'm an artist and a graphic designer, there's still some other types of uh, creative entrepreneurs that listen to the podcast, but my podcast is geared towards all things creative entrepreneurship. So I talk about marketing, I talk about 
specifically marketing. I talk about Pinterest marketing. I talk about email marketing. I just recorded a bunch of episodes on email marketing. Actually, I talk about finances and budgeting. I've had, I just had a guest on who is a financial planner and helps creative entrepreneurs really plan for all the hiccups in starting and growing a business. And so we talk about all things creative business on the podcast. And then my YouTube channel, the person that I'm talking to there is either just wanting some form of art therapy and learning watercolor seems interesting to them or um, is a designer, let's say, but doesn't do anything analog. Everything is digital and they're designing all their patterns or all their artwork is on, you know, an iPad or on a computer and they just want to learn something that's tactile and more analog. So it's a very like a little bit nuancy for the YouTube channel because there's so many different types of people learning watercolor. But for the podcast, it's very specific. Like, here's how to grow your creative business using this tool, Pinterest or using email marketing or how to use hashtags on Instagram, stuff like that. Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of talked about like how you balance all this work now, I guess, like so it's split up between every week. You do it by weeks. <laughs> yeah wow i, I feel know. like i don't know how i would do that because i feel like if i want to plan something for one week it would change like the next day and then i would have to go back and are you like replanning all the time or the or only kind of works thing, out? yeah so the only thing that i'm really replanning or moving around are the podcast episodes so like if miles decides he's not gonna nap today i can't record the podcast so i have to right. move it back couple days sometimes it moves back a week like this week I was doing podcasts instead of last week um and so because we had like different things come up last week so it's definitely flexible because we are recording and we're so far ahead so like yesterday I recorded six or seven episodes for the podcast that won't be coming up coming out until December and so it there is flexibility there and that's why I love working week by week because I used to work just like I would sit down what do I have to do today I would kind of twiddle my thumbs, like uh, kind of bounce around from my email and like, oh, I'm working on this pattern. Oh, I forgot I need to text this person back. Oh, I need to paint that thing. I'm going to go back to designing. So there's a lot of ping ponging. And with that, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of time that is being used up just because you're distracted or you're going from your email to your and you're not zoning in on one thing. I don't know about anybody listening, but I have a very, like, very strong ADD. It's diagnosed. It's not, I'm not just saying that. I actually have ADD. And so it sounds like working week to week would be not beneficial for me, but I have never thrived more yeah. <laughs> in my mind. So I feel like because I know exactly what I'm doing each week when I sit down at my in my office, I don't waste time thinking about what I need to do or bouncing back and forth between tasks. I know exactly what I need to do. And obviously there's like a luxury to that because I have somebody now who answers my emails. I'm not the one answering all of my emails. However, when you're a solopreneur, you're doing all the things, you're juggling all the hats. So sometimes going back and forth between things has to happen because oh, something urgent hops into your urgent comes up in your inbox. So I'm going to stop doing this pattern. And I'm going to hop into my inbox. So I thankfully have, um a team now where i'm able to work that way and it's very beneficial for me obviously not it's not for everyone but just a little yeah. less distraction but <laughs> still a lot um so yeah. we'll kind of like wrap this up and again remember we're going to do this again on the 12th so that way um everyone can make it and we will figure out our tech issues beforehand um <laughs> but what advice would you give to someone looking to get started in their their own creative business oh so many things um <laughs> I mean, one of the main things that I would say is to put blinders on um, and to not become distracted with this person's success or this project that they just got or booked or this meeting that they're having with this fancy person in this fancy office building. Um, I know it sounds super cliche and it's probably been said a million times before, but it's so easy to look at someone's Instagram or website and see you know, the success that they're having. And you're really just looking at the middle point of their journey. Like, for example, if you're looking at my Instagram and seeing I just launched a planner collection in Staples or, you know, a case to collection or whatever, we just launched an online course. Like, obviously, it's easy to get envious of that or say, I want that success. Why am I not there yet? But that is eight years in. If you would have seen me, you know, the first three, the first five years even of me operating my business behind the scenes, I was pulling my hair out, crying a lot, and I'm not a crier, um, and struggling to make ends meet. Like the first three years of owning my business, I, we barely broke even in profits. 
and just like the amount of stress <laughs> that I was experiencing on a daily basis of like, is this client going to pay me? Is it going to be enough that I charge them to recover my costs on printing? All of these things that, that were constantly keeping me up at night, I thankfully have those less and less and less and less each year. And this year I feel like has finally been the most stress-free I've ever been in my career. But it's because of all that hard work and that foundation that I built in the early days of being a solo, solopreneur, struggling through the mistakes and all that. So I would say my biggest piece of advice for people wanting to start a creative business or are in that like middle phase is just to put blinders on. I know it's hard, but to hone in on who your ideal customer is, who you're talking to, who you're wanting to talk to. And what works for someone over here might not work for you. And every business is different, just like every kid is different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that it all worked out and you're having a, a stress-free year in a stressful year, I guess, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And sorry, everyone, for the tech issues. We're going to do this again. Um, yes. And we're going to possibly figure out a different platform or something. But mm -hmm. look out for an email. We have all of your emails so we can send something out. Um, and maybe we'll collect questions beforehand and get those questions out for everyone. So we will let you know. But thank you, everyone, so much for joining. Um, and we'll hopefully see you on the 12th, too. Yes, see you on the 12th. And somebody asked if I use white paper or natural. I use the extra white, I think. Stonehenge Aqua, cold pressed whatever. But if you want to print extra white is good for saturation. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.